okay? And projector screen in the front, all the bells and whistles. Okay, and then there's the studio with some variable acoustics. We'll see some better examples of that. Basically, doors that open and close can change the impulse response of the room, basically mid-frequency reverb time. Sometimes the room has to be dry because they might be doing vocals or ADR work. Sometimes the room has to be wet because they might have a string session. Um, it has to be a lot of things, so this is an all-purpose room. Um, let's take a look at some other. This is basically NPR in Moscow. Okay, so that's another industry that's always going to want studios. Actually, the radio industry is exploding. We have a lot of projects now where we're building full-on recording studios. They're just called radio stations. But for all intents and purposes, they're recording studios. They are recording studios. Okay, uh, and the NPR system in this country is huge. This is, the NP this is more or less the NPR from Moscow. It's called Kultura. Actually, has a name I can't even pronounce, but that's what we call it with a K, and this is their main facility in Moscow, and this, was their, this is where the Moscow Symphony did all their recording for years. It's a rather old room, which we got to measure. I just put it up there because it's fun. Very, very big room, which also had a tailing reverb time at the low end that rolled off. Even these Russian guys knew this. It was really interesting. Um, but we did get to redo their current rooms. They did not want Russian engineers. They wanted Western engineers. It was interesting. I had no that was my first question. Why are you coming to someone in the United States? They said, we, don't, we only want someone in the United States. And it was that room right there. We'll take a look at it. Okay, these were some of the computer renderings that we did to model it up. And that's this room right here. And again, completely symmetric. To squeeze it in and get it to work was a trick. Even that little glass right there, which is that window, is kind of tricking. There's the glass, but there's the exterior window. So some of the glass looks into a wall, but we needed that guy to be symmetrical to that guy. Now here, already you've seen two or three rooms, and you're noticing that they're not rectangular. Okay, so here I was saying nothing wrong with rectangular rooms, but I'm flashing up one non-rectangular room after another. Why? <coughs> Generally speaking, it, the, the, what's the phenomena? Um, the, pheno the easiest way to describe this phenomena and uh, this is something I didn't know at the age of 22, and I'm not sure if anybody knew it at Electric Lady, but now we do know it, okay? And it, it's fun to learn. It's fun to know this stuff. The, the term that is easiest to describe it is one called SBIR, speaker boundary interference, okay? It is essentially um, that quality of a speaker which has the low frequency energy coming out of the back of the speaker, okay, and returning off of a boundary into the room and, of course, coming at you out of phase, kind of causing, for lack of a better term, a low-frequency comb filter. It's not exactly a comb filter, but it has the same kind of effect. It's a shift in the time domain, which is getting transformed. Think of the time domain as 90 degrees off from the frequency domain. I see a few people shaking their heads, and then I see a lot of that, so look, work with me. <laughs> Okay, so if we have a shift in the time domain, you're going to hear it in the frequency domain. A comb filter is much more identifiable. That is when you have a direct source of sound arriving at you, like speaker to your ear, and then a reflection causing almost the same amount of sound to come just a few milliseconds later, a few feet later. What would cause that? A big console surface or a giant piece of metal you're mixing here, and there's a giant piece of metal right here. Speaker, direct, boom, boom. You got an extra three feet. That's about three milliseconds, approximately one foot per millisecond, approximately. So, and it's inside 10 decibels, so we have the same amount of sound almost coming a few milliseconds later. That's a comb filter. That's going to cause a comb filter. And it, the reason why is because it creates a kind of a frequency response that looks like a comb. Everybody's familiar with that, okay? So why would you put a big giant piece of metal right near you? Well, I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in where they roll in a six-foot rack. On one side, no less. It would be better to have it at least on both sides. If you have a comb filter, you might as well have it symmetrical. I never understood that. Or how many clubs have you been in where the mixing position is all the way in the back of the room because they don't want to give up a good seat? And what's behind the mixer? Flat sheetrock wall. Put up a packing blanket least help yourself because you get that sound boom boom it's coming back back only a few feet later a few milliseconds later so the low frequency version of that okay can really cause some problems 
To make a very long story, and it is very long short, the easiest way to solve it, there are a number of ways to solve it, but the easiest way to solve it is to baffle the speakers. And you see this a lot in a lot of studios. Basically put the speakers in a wall, a rigid wall. So now there is no rear energy. It's the, all the energy is coming out on a plane. Okay, when you do that, the next immediate boundary, which is this one, if it's at a right angle, you're almost automatically going to get a reflection from the left speaker off the right wall back to you. The only way to avoid it is to either put up a lot of absorption on that wall, the foam people would have you do that, all the people who sell foam, all those guys, not mentioning any names, okay, they would have you foam up that area, and then some, because they want to sell foam, or I have another idea, why don't we just angle the walls? and let the energy stay in the room, keep the decay rate high, keep the reverb time up, send the energy behind you into a rear wall where we could have diffusion, everybody knows what that is, and then by the time it finally gets to you, it's down 20 or 30 dB and it just dies or melts into the ambiance of the room, much more musical environment. That's why you see this so often. So when you see these angled walls, you usually have a baffled speaker installation. Yeah. What's the fusion? Well, okay. Okay, great. I guess we're going there. <laughs> I guess we're going. Okay, I don't have that slide. I wasn't prepared for, wasn't prepared. Um, but we'll do it without the slide. Um, <clears throat> there are, uh, I, I just want to know if I want to answer or I want to wait. Um, yeah, let's just go. In acoustics, so I guess we're going to go for the 10 minutes, the 10 minute crash, the really super crash acoustics course. Recording studio acoustics, two universes, isolation acoustics, internal room acoustics, two totally different universes. You need both of them. Isolation acoustics, by definition, I think you can figure out what that is, keeping rooms quiet. People don't bother us, we don't bother them, no noisy air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It results in room within room construction, oversized walls, special doors, uh, caulking, special glass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine we spent 40 hours discussing this and you too can build isolated rooms, okay? Or not isolated rooms. If you're in the middle of nowhere, you don't need isolated rooms. Although the owner of that studio on the mountain thought that he didn't need any isolation because he was up there once or twice on a beautiful summer day or even, you know, and it was really quiet, but he was never up there in the rain. So isolation. But none of that has anything to do with internal room acoustics, which is what happens when you propagate sound in the room. Source, receive. Typically the source would be an instrument and a mic or a speaker and an ear. Let's use the speaker and the ear because that's what's going on in the control room. In a, mic, in a studio, it's usually some source and a microphone. Studio, speaker, ear. Now the, a control room. The control room is a very interesting environment. We have very high standards of our expectations in the listening position. That's the bad news. The good news is things don't move around very much. Nobody moves. The speakers don't move. You don't move. We know where everything is, like a car. So we have high standards, but we also have control. So what can we do in that room to control the behavior of the internal room acoustics? There's only a few things we can do. One thing we can do is we can change the geometry of the room. That's the first thing we can do. And then the only other thing we could do is change what we do to the surfaces. None of this has anything to do with the isolation. So let's discuss the surfaces. What can we do to the surfaces? I will submit for your consideration that there are really only three things we could do. We could take a surface and make it absorptive. We could take a surface and make it reflective. Or we could make it diffusive. Absorptive, I think everybody knows what that means. Sound hits the surface and doesn't come back. But it's not like it either doesn't come back or it all comes back. No, maybe a percentage of it would come back. And so if that wall was 50% absorptive, it would have an absorption coefficient of 50%. But now it gets fun because it turns out that there's no surface in the world that behaves the same at all frequencies. 